Our next speaker <laughs> is uh, Dr. Craig Foster. He's a psychology professor of behavioral sciences and leadership development at the United States Air Force Academy. He received his PhD in social psychology from the University of North Carolina, and his research interests include scientific reasoning, skepticism, and pseudoscience. But you might have thought that this might be an unfalsifiable claim. No, science can be applied to a lot of things. I'll leave it to Dr. Foster. Thank you very much. Um, I know that this topic might seem like a niche topic or maybe even a little bit silly. I was pleased to hear everybody chuckle at the title. But I actually think this is a really interesting topic to examine whether uh, how faith can conflict with scientific reasoning. It's also informative to consider that many United States residents actually believe that God directly influences the outcomes of sports. Polls demonstrate that about 25% of residents in the United States believe this. And those of you that watch sports at all probably noticed that there are a lot of comments made by athletes and fans that seem to illustrate a belief that God influences sports. I'm only going to give you two examples. There are many that I could pull from. Uh, one was the divine intervention for Tim Tebow time phenomenon. Uh, Tim Tebow was a very publicly devout Christian quarterback, and he um, won a handful of games when he became a starter in dramatic fashion despite not being very good. And uh, this, many people took this to mean that God was helping out Tim Tebow. And there's also the uh, Russell Wilson, uh, Aaron Rodgers spat. Russell Wilson is a very devout Christian quarterback and the Seahawks defeated the Packers in a dramatic playoff game. And after the game, Russell Wilson suggested that God set it up that way. It turns out that I think a year later, sometime later, the Packers actually defeated Russell Wilson and the Seahawks, and Aaron Rodgers sort of boldly suggested that uh, God must have been a Packers fan that day. <laughs> there are many biblical stories where God rewards people for being faithful. I did a very scholarly review of this using my son's illustrated children's Bible. <laughs> it was fabulous. I could get through the whole thing in one day. It was like cliff notes for the Bible. And uh, of all things, the story that stood out to me the most, of course, is the story of David and Goliath. I thank George for providing a review of this, so I don't need to go into a lot of detail other than to remind you that a very faithful, uh, which one's which, yeah, I'm sorry, the very faithful David, you know, stood up to Goliath and, and with uh, the Lord behind him was able to win. And by the way, I learned later, thanks to the Gideons, that the adult story is a lot more gruesome. And then there's also prosperity theology, which suggests that if you're faithful, God will shift things in your favor. And this is promoted most notably, of course, by Joel Wallstein. Mm -hmm. I thought I, I thought it was. <laughs> when you put all these sentiments together, what they really suggest is a theory that seems to be somewhat clear, and that's that God uses sports to reward faithful athletes or to promote faith itself. What if we could test it? Mm. That I thought would be fascinating because you have two, two outcomes essentially, right? You could demonstrate that this is another illustration of paranormal thinking, or if we treat the theory with respect, of course, we should recognize that there's the possibility, being open minded, that we could obtain evidence for God. And this would be the greatest scientific discovery of all time, of uh, all in sports literature. You know, it's amazing. But there's a problem with testing it. There's two problems that really stand out. One, I would call person variance. So, let's say Russell Wilson is a faithful quarterback. I think that's believable enough. But there are literally tens of thousands of people that are emotionally invested in an NFL football team. So we don't know what the Packers believe. We don't know what the other Seahawks believe. And then I find this idea really uncomfortable, and it's a question I'd love to ask Russell Wilson. On that day, I bet, I mean, just from a probabilistic standpoint, there was probably a very faithful, terminally ill child that just wanted the Packers to win. And so, why would God do that to that child? It just seems odd. The other problem is, of course, that the God of sports belief comes from a variety of anecdotes cobbled together. But I was driving home one day thinking about whether God influences sports because I'm weird like that. And it, I thought, I think you could examine this using the NCAA basketball championships because it provides some advantages that you don't regularly have. And the first one is you get around this idea of person variance because you have the religious affiliation of schools rather than of players so that 
The entities themselves are either religious in nature or non-religious in nature. A presumably secular ranking system occurs right before the tournament. Now I call it presumably secular because I don't get to go to the meetings. But judging by the way that this is discussed after they create the ranking system, there's a lot of discussion about um, record and strength of schedule and offense and defense. And I think it's safe to assume that nobody in any of these meetings is saying, okay, I know this team has a lousy record and a poor strength of schedule, but they are going to have Jesus on their side. And Jesus probably is going to be good for a three-pointer or two. I think we should rank them higher. I'm assuming that does not happen. And then right after this ranking system, they play these games of dramatically increased importance. For people that follow basketball at all, you know that they call it the big dance. And even going is a real, real privilege. So what I did was I examined the last five years of the NCAA tournament using only the men's, or using only the last five years, both men's and women's. I couldn't think of any reason God would prefer the men's tournament to the women's tournament, so I used them both. And I focused only on the first round. The first round has a couple of advantages because it um, occurs immediately after the ranking system, so there's no reason to think, you know, you can't introduce extra error by having the two things far apart. And the first round has this really nice, consistent ranking system. A number one seed always plays a number 16 seed. The number one seeds are the ranked as the best teams in the tournament. The number 16 seeds are the worst teams in the tournament. And so a number one seed is a heavy, heavy favorite. And then it scales backwards from there, from two seed, playing a 15 seed is a heavy favorite, but not quite as much. And it goes all the way down and down and down until you have an eight seed playing a nine seed. And an eight seed playing a nine seed is a weak, weak favorite. Here's an example of the brackets and how they work. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, you can see that there are four regions, and in each region there would be a one and a 16, scaling back to an eight versus a nine, and so it provides a lot of observations to test whether God is influencing the tournament in any way. And I coded all the schools for being non-sectarian or religiously affiliated. And it does something interesting, it creates four types of matchups. So you always have a favorite playing an underdog, but you can have a non-sectarian favorite playing a non-sectarian underdog. You can have a religiously affiliated favorite playing a religiously affiliated underdog. And then you can have a non-sectarian favorite playing a religiously affiliated underdog, and of course you can have a religiously affiliated favorite playing a non-sectarian underdog. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> I'll make it easier for you. The first two conditions, there shouldn't be anything going on because both schools are equal in their celebration of God, with non-sectarians having none and religiously affiliated both uh, being faithful. But in the bottom two conditions, you get what we, what we could call the testing condition. If God helps religiously affiliated institutions during the really important times, then you would expect religiously affiliated institutions during this big tournament to perform at a slightly above average rate or a wildly above average rate. And you would expect non-sectarian institutions, if the theory is correct, to play at a below average rate or win at a below average rate. So let's get to the results of this system. Uh, underdogs won 22% of the time, and here you can see what you could call the two control conditions. So the non-sectarian schools upset non-sectarian schools 21.4% of the time. And that's uh, not a surprise that it would be close. The majority, maybe not the majority, a lot of the matchups are non-sectarian, non-sectarian. And then you can see that there was only five religiously affiliated matchups, and the upset rate was 40% of the time. But the interesting conditions actually follow. Religiously affiliated institutions only upset non-sectarian institutions 18% of the time. And non-sectarian institutions actually upset religiously affiliated institutions at an above average rate. So the summary of this is that there's no evidence that God is helping religiously affiliated teams during the first round of the NCAA tournament. <laughs> But I want to encourage everybody, myself included, to be thoughtful about how our pro skepticism messages are received. This research really isn't intended to be an attack on God or religion. It's intended to illustrate and promote scientific reasoning. And to that end, I want to point out something. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 
uh, part of the justification I feel for promoting scientific reasoning is uh, my institution, the United States Air Force Academy, has named it as one of its outcomes that it wants to produce in all of our graduates and future officers. And you can see there that nice little sign. That's actually graduation. It isn't a bunch of cadets super excited about our outcomes. <laughs> <laughs> a little weird, like, yeah, we got outcomes. <laughs> we just put the words on top of it. Okay, so what happens when we take a scientific approach? It's actually relatively simple, right? We found a testable hypothesis. There was no supporting evidence using a representative set of observations. And then we come to our burden of proof issue. Right? With no evidence, we don't really see any reason to believe. But what I find really informative about this, because I don't think anybody really thought I was going to disprove God today and I kept it just for this conference. <laughs> is you could still justify God and sports using a paranormal approach, and it illustrates how pseudoscience works. The first thing you would do is just use the anecdotes that support the theory, create a non-falsifiable claim, this might be familiar to some of you, God rewards, but then God sometimes does not reward. <laughs> Develop ad hoc hypotheses, so one could say, well, okay, it didn't work in basketball, but it, it could work in football. And that's goalpost moving. Mm -hmm. the anti <laughs> yeah, but very clever. That's not kind of funny enough. Uh, the anti vaxxers like this one. Here's another one commonly used by anti vaxxers. Claim that the influence is so subtle that's why it eludes detection. You can offer a claim but discourage examination of the claim. And the religious nature of this provides this sort of extra opportunity to use this particular tactic. So one could say, don't put a question mark where God has put a period. That's a Joel Austin quote, by the way. Yes. And then here's another one. Offer the claim, but then say that any examination of the claim is anti-religious and offensive. But in a way, I don't really feel like I'm being at all anti-religious because I would actually encourage Christians to stay away from this claim because it creates awkward theological questions. Such as, why would God care about sports when there are more important social problems? This is the most common thing I hear when I tell people that I've been investigating this topic. Does God support one faith more than another? So Villanova is really good, that's true. Uh, does that mean that God prefers Catholics to other faiths? I mean, I think that would be an uncomfortable thing to suggest. But this last one, honestly, is the, maybe that's God calling right before I get to this. <laughs> this last one is the one that's really, really important to me because as far as I know, you better pick it up, I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, as far as I know, I'm the only person that suggested this publicly, and I think it's a great theological question. And I think it's one you all appreciate. If atheists burn in hell for all eternity, does God really need them to lose this course too? <laughs> Eternity, but that's not enough. You're going to miss the kick in your high school championship game. It just seems to me that it's hanging on a little too thick. <laughs> that's Aaron Foster. He is uh, uh, publicly, he's been an atheist for some time, and somebody took the time to Photoshop God and wolves working against him. <laughs> some might argue that it is immoral, as I noted earlier, to question God's purported influence. <laughs> But failures in scientific reasoning cause significant harm. And I could pick from many, many of the topics that have, that have been presented this weekend, but I'm just gonna pick one because it stands out to me, and that's climate change. And this book is a really nice illustration of a number of scientific failures that can uh, contribute to this significant harm. I would also point out to you that the God of Sports Theory actually maps on really well to the idea of faith healing. It's basically the same process, right? It's this notion that I'm encountering some problem, and if I'm faithful enough, God is going to remove that problem on my behalf. So when you look at this issue, oh, pardon me, here's all the documentation of faith, uh, faith healing, uh, Randy's book and Paul Offit's book, and they provide just overwhelming detail on how often this still occurs in the United States. And in this context, what really stands out is that teaching scientific reasoning and promoting it is actually really, really moral. So then you have this tension, what do we do with this? Well, the first thing I would say is I acknowledge readily that it's just sports. But the God of Sports question illustrates this tension really, really well. And it does so in maybe a safer context where people can actually listen to it and cope with the idea. 
And so I would conclude with these couple of points. Believers are going to look at this and they may say, well, no wonder you didn't find any evidence for this. That's because the effect is subtle or it's unpredictable or it's untestable. And in return, I'm willing to respect that I actually do. I understand that that's a, pro a possibility and this is where maybe faith takes over and scientific reasoning stops. But if you're going to make that argument, then a couple of things logically follow, which represent to me at least sort of a sensible middle ground. Practically speaking, the most obvious is take your kids to the doctor. I don't know who has a sick child and says, let's use the method that's unreliable and untestable. So take your sick kids to the doctor, that seems rather obvious. But the other one is, don't force this type of unreliable claim into physical education classes. And you might look at me and go, well, why in the world would anybody do a thing like that? And I would look at you and I would say, that's exactly right, and that's the point I'd like to conclude.